In the second part of chapter 10, after they talk about the different types of sampling, the last half of the chapter deals with data collection. And then again, I want to reinforce, this is all pertaining to quantitative research studies. So none of this is germane to qualitative studies. So this presentation is going to present the, day, the way we collect data in quantitative studies. So first of all, your book describes three major categories or classes of data collection in a quantitative study. It can either be a self-report, some type of observation, or some sort of biophysiologic measure. So we're going to go through each one of those, and I'll give you several examples to help make this make more sense. So self-report is exactly what it sounds like. You, your participants in your study are giving you information. They're either doing that through writing or some sort of interview, but there has to be a formal instrument. Note this word structured. Remember, we're talking about quantitative research here. Quantitative is not a flexible anything goes design. Remember, quantitative is very rigid and structured. So when we're collecting data from participants in a quantitative study, we're going to either have some kind of written questionnaire to where all of the participants have exactly the same questions in the same order with the same response options, or we'll do some sort of interview, but there is going to be a definite script that I have to read and I can't vary on what I say or how I ask the questions. Also remember that this is quantitative. So the answers that I get for either of these options have to be able to be converted into some sort of number. So an interview um, example could be a telephone based interview for patients who were discharged from a hospital and were doing a, call, a phone call to ask them to rate their um, satisfaction with their hospital stay. This could be totally automated. You could have pre-recorded questions and have the patient or participant answer one for um, um, do not agree and five for agree or that kind of thing as whereas questionnaires are going to be more like a survey and we'll look at examples of those as well so this is an example of a survey as i mentioned and again you have to convert this into numbers so this is actually the edinburgh postpartum depression survey the epds which is a very common um, postpartum depression screening tool and you can see it's composed of 10 questions all of them have a scale and let's say I have blamed myself unnecessarily when things have gone wrong. Question three, if the new mom answers not very often, then I would enter that as a number one in my data um, spreadsheet. And then when I get ready to analyze data, I have those categories there grouped by numbers. This is another example. This is from a um, bureau, bureau uh, can't talk today, bureaucratic caring survey. So for example, number 10, Nurses treat each patient as an individual. This frequently happens within the organization where I work. So the nurse would state whether he or she strongly disagreed or agreed or somewhere in between, and I would enter the corresponding number into my data um, spreadsheet. So for structured instruments, I have a couple of options. Really what you're going to see in a quantitative study is going to be a closed ended question. Okay. I know you learned in psych that we want to use open ended questions to where we can allow participants to give us their stories. That's definitely the case in a qualitative study, but in a quantitative study, we want fixed um, option questions. So yes or no, true or false, some kind of Likert scale, because again, it has to be converted into a number. Your book has a little chart that shows you some of the different types of questions. These, I have them um, listed here. For a dichotomous question, that's gonna have two choices. So yes or no, true or false. You either have to agree or disagree. There's no um, neutral ground. There's no five point rating system. It's just a two option selection. A multiple choice question, I don't have to tell you guys what that is. As nursing students, you probably hate multiple choice questions, but we do use them for data collection purposes. Um, a forced choice question usually um, is asking about your attitudes, opinions, beliefs, feelings about something, and they purposely force you to choose a side. So they don't give you the neutral or neither yes or no. You either have to be pro or 
um, con for or against something and they force you to choose a side with that type of question. And then with ratings, you typically think of like a one to ten, a zero to ten or a one to five, um, some kind of Likert scale. So there are several advantages of questionnaires, most of which they're easy to do. You can do them on paper. You can do them online. I could just send you a quick survey link and you can answer those questions pretty uh, quickly. And therefore, it can be very geographically dispersed because if I'm doing it via email, I can send that to anyone all over the world. Also, because I'm not physically seeing you or talking to you necessarily, you can be anonymous in a questionnaire. So you may be more forthright in what you tell me in a questionnaire. With an interview, you definitely lose the anonymity, but there's typically a higher response rate. It's super easy to just delete an email about a survey, but if someone calls you, you may be more willing to listen to what they have to say and participate in a brief interview if it's a cause you believe in. Um, also, you don't have to worry about literacy here. So for a written questionnaire, obviously the individual would have to be able to read and comprehend the language in which it's written. But for an interview, you don't have to worry about whether they can read or not. You would, you read the questions aloud to them. Okay. And then also, if I'm interviewing you face to face, I can see your nonverbal communication as well. So it's not just looking at numbers circled on a paper, but I can compare that with what your body language was actually saying. Okay, there are different kinds of scales. When we see the word composite scale, that typically means I'm going to add up the numbers into one summed score for a, an instrument. So if you think back to the Edinburgh postnatal or postpartum depression survey or scale, um, there were 10 items. So m the most points that you would get on that would be a 50. So I would take how the participant answered questions one through 10, I would add them up and that's called a summated rating scale, okay? Or a composite scale. We add it up and look at one number instead of individual scores for each of the 10 items. Frequently those do use Likert scales, as you saw with the two example surveys I showed you earlier. Most of the time there are an odd number of options. Usually the middle one is neutral or neither agree nor disagree. That's pretty common. Um, again, I just <laughs> told you all of this, so we're going to skip that. These are some examples of Likert skills. They may ask you about your agreement with a phrase. They may ask how frequently you do some kind of behavior, how likely you are to participate in some kind of health behavior, or how important something is to you in your day-to-day -day life. Another option that is a self-report is called a visual analog, analog skill or VAS. The thing to note is that, and I have an example on the next slide, it has to be 100 millimeters in length. It has two endpoints, and they're usually labeled as extreme and none or some kind of um, opposites. And you have the participant make a mark anywhere on that scale, on that line that indicates their current position. So here we go. This is an example. Let's pretend, because this is not, that this line from this point to this point would be 100 millimeters. And so you would have the patient or participant rate their current level of pain. It's somewhere between none at all and pain as bad as it could be. And so let's say they marked right here. So what I would do is I'd get a millimeter ruler. I would start my zero down here at the end and then I would measure and see what number of millimeters the actual marked spot correlates to and that's what I would put into my spreadsheet for my data. Um, so while self-report is great and we can collect a lot of different types of data this way, there are definitely some disadvantages to this type of um, data collection. Most of all, Sometimes people lie. <laughs> I mean, that sounds obvious, but sometimes we don't think about that. So we have to understand that there are certain types of biases that exist in this type of study research. So first of all is the social desirability response set bias. If we're asking questions about touchy subjects socially, for example, you're surveying some pregnant women in their second trimester and you ask them how frequently they use illicit drug substances such as amphetamines, meth, um, cocaine, um, marijuana, whatever it may be. How often do they do that? 
social desirability says that they should not be using that, right? So even if they use meth every day, what is the likelihood they're going to be honest and tell you that? Probably not. So they'll probably skew toward what the socially desirable answer would be. So you have to think about that. There are certain topics that are going to be very difficult for you to get honest answers about, such as child abuse, elder abuse, drug use during pregnancy or at any time for that matter. Um, so just know that that's, <laughs> that's there. Um, extreme response set is what you see here on this little example. Th what that means is that for the most part, a, a, a typical person doesn't really have feelings and emotions at the extreme end, either horribly angry or super excellent. Okay, so maybe one or two questions on a survey do you really feel strongly about like that was super poor, or this was really excellent. But for 10 items, you're not going to really feel that something was excellent for all 10 items, really. I mean, you're, you're usually just not going to feel that way. Um, but for the, we know this because of tons of surveys that people typically go five, 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 because it's quick. And we, that's what you want to hear, right? Is that everything was excellent. So that's also called an acquiescence response set or yay sayers where they say yes to everything. And they say that everything was great or exceptional or excellent. And so you have to realize that. And so what sometimes people do to combat this is they'll change the wording of some of the items. So for instance, I may make some of them negatively worded, meaning if you answer a five, that's really not good. And then sometimes I'll use one and then I'll flip them with positively worded items to where I do want you to answer a five. So that way I can look and if somebody just answered five, 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 I know they didn't really read the survey. So sometimes researchers will do those kinds of mixing up positive and negative wording to keep this type of issue at bay. And if they actually get responses that answer 55555, they may end up throwing that out and not even accepting that as data in their survey because it is biased data. Um, also, we have to think about how we ask our questions, because I just think that this little um, survey is super cute. Would you say that the king is doing a good job, an outstanding job, or a terrific job? Okay, so we can't have any inherent bias in the way we're asking or wording the questions either. And especially surrounding socially charged issues, we can't use negative are emotionally laden terms, we have to stick with scientific terms so that we don't make people understand how we want them to answer the question. So again, self-reports, they're pretty easy to do. You can access a lot of information and data from participants that way, but anytime we're asking for human participation and honesty, you, you got to know that sometimes people are going to lie. And so we have to take that into account as we're analyzing our data. And realize that there's going to be error in this. So the second main type of data collection and quantitative besides self-report is observation. And again, there's that word again, structured. Everything we do in quantitative research is super structured and planned out in advance. So there will be some kind of instrument that we have to use that will be able to collect or convert what we're looking at into numbers. So I want you to think of the flack scale. That is a very excellent example of observation and quantitative research. The scale looks the same for everyone that we evaluate or observe. And so if I walked into a patient's room who was nonverbal, perhaps on a ventilator um, and sedated, and you walked into the same patient's room, and at the same time, we both observe the patient and we're trying to fill out the flax scale. Feasibly, we should come up with the same exact answer, give or take plus or minus one point. But we should have some kind of way to structured look at a look at a participant and fill out some kind of formal instrument to convert that into a number, just like a flax scale would. Okay. Um, so again, a rating scale is going to be uh did I what did I do? Okay, yeah, sorry. So the rating scale is going to be done 
while we're doing our observation. So we're going to have to have specific rules. So how often are we going to evaluate this person, their flax skill? Or how often are we going to go measure the size of this pressure injury to compare results over the course of this study? Um, if we are, say, measuring the size of a wound, that is observation. And there will be specific rules on how we measure that. Like, for instance, we always measure length first at the longest point. Then we measure width next at the widest point, And then we measure depth last at the deepest point, And we record our measurements. There's a lot of error that can happen there if the observers are not doing it exactly the same way and every single time. Um, your book talks about two different types of sampling for observation and quantitative studies. It can either be based on time intervals or based on events. So time sampling would be like, I'm going to go sit at the nurse's station at whichever hospital unit, and I'm going to observe the nurse's activities between 4 p.m and 8 p.m. on certain days. So I have specific start and stop times or intervals, and I will observe everything that happens at that point. And then once I leave, oh well, I won't get to see what's happening. And that's fine. Usually you don't just go once, you're gonna go several different times to, to observe whatever it is you're observing. Event sampling is if we're really interested in one specific thing, and it may happen at very unique times. So for example, codes, a code blue in a hospital, there's no predictable way to know exactly what time that's going to happen. So if I were doing a study based on a code, I might sit at a nurse's station from 4 to 8 p.m. and never have a code. But if I worked in that hospital, what I could do is anytime code blue is called overhead, I will start my observation. I'll go to whatever unit the code has taken place in and I'll begin my observation. And as soon as the code's over, I stop my observation, I write a few notes to myself, and then I get back to my work. And I'm only interested in that specific, specific event, so I'm only doing my observ observing when that event is physically happening. So again, observation can be great. We can see a lot of different behaviors that we might not be able to pick up with a questionnaire, per se. But you have to know that there are biases with this type of data collection as well. First of which is reactivity. When people know that they're being watched, then they automatically have a tendency to change their normal behaviors. You guys learned that in fundamentals when you learned how to count respirations. You were not taught to tell the patient, okay, Mr. Jones, I'm about to count the number of times you breathe because what's the patient gonna do? They're gonna automatically probably exaggerate their breathing to make sure it's big enough that you can count it but that's not his normal breathing pattern. So we have to be able to be kind of a fly on the wall and out of the way and kind of blend into the background so that we're not as much risk of changing their normal behaviors. The other factor is with me, the observer. I have biases as well. I might see things the way I want to see them and not necessarily in the way that they're actually happening in real time. So for example, if I'm on a code blue committee in my hospital and I'm collecting data observing codes and I've taught all these people how to run a code, then I'm hopeful that they're doing what they're supposed to do because if they're not, I'm not a very good teacher on that, right? So I would possibly have more of a positive view of these people since they're my coworkers and I taught them how to run a code in ACLS and now here they are. So I have to be aware of my own potential biases as I'm collecting data as well. The third and final type of quantitative data collection has to do with biophysiologic measures. And these are the types of measurements that as nurses, you are the most familiar with. So for example, temperature, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, height, weight, urine output, any of that kind of stuff, that's biophysiologic measures. Lab values, so what is their total cholesterol? What was their serum cortisol level? What was their hemoglobin A1C, etc. That's all bodily functions that we are measuring in some form or fashion. And your book differentiates between in vivo 
and in vitro. And I want you to think of in vitro fertilization. With in vitro fertilization, we are working outside the body. So we have a sperm, we have an egg, we join them outside the body. So they have been removed from their host. Okay, that is exactly what happens with in vitro measurement. So I'm actually taking something from the body and measuring it. So this could be a stool specimen. It could be urine wound um, drainage, like uh, for culture. It could be serum. It could be uh, saliva, sputum. Um, it could be some kind of tissue biopsy. Um, but I have taken something from the body and I've moved it elsewhere to measure it. That's what in vitro measurement is. And that's pretty common in um, tests. You know, if I'm working on a pharmaceutical trial that is for cholesterol, obviously the, the participants are going to come in and have their blood drawn ever so often. And we'll probably look at their HDL, LDL, total cholesterol, liver function tests, maybe kidney function tests to make sure that the medicines aren't having any indirect effects on those liver and kidney functions as well. Now with in vivo, we're not taking anything out of the body. So that would be temperature. I just stick a thermometer probe in and it tells me what your temperature is or head circumference for a newborn. I'm just sticking the measurement tape around their head. Nothing has taken, is taken out of the body. Blood pressure, I'm not taking anything out of the body. Oxygen saturation, same thing. Peak flow meter, they're breathing in or breathing out. Um, if, if I'm doing respiratory pulmonary function tests, that's not taking anything out of the body. So those types of measurements are called in vivo. And so here's an example question for you just to see if you get that. Which procedure of all of these listed would I classify as an in vivo? Okay, you can pause it and see if you can figure out the answer. Okay, so now that you've looked at this, hopefully you would say the answer is D, body temperature, because that is not removing anything out of the body. Go back, the other ones are. I'm removing tissue, I'm removing um, glucose, and I may be removing some kind of wound exudate or maybe um, serum for um, blood cultures or urine or whatever. That's removing something from the body. And our last slide is how do biophysiological measures stack up? Honestly, they're pretty good in nursing studies because we are used to collecting this type of data. So they are very, usually very accurate because typically we have the right kinds of equipment to measure these with some sort of reliability. We can calibrate our machines like our sphygmometers and our scales. We can calibrate our glucometers if we're checking blood glucose. So we have pretty good machines to be able to precisely measure these things. Also, they can be pretty cost effective because a lot of times we already have this stuff in house in hospitals. So we shouldn't have to go out and buy new equipment. We, we oftentimes have what we need to run these types of data, but, and that's a big note at the bottom. We have to make sure that everyone who is collecting this data is doing it in the same way. So we have to have training. So for example, how many different ways are there to check a blood glucose level? I'm sorry, <laughs> a blood pressure, a bunch. So we either have to all use manual or we all have to use automatic. We have to have some kind of way to ensure the correct cuff size. We have to, if we're doing manual, are we actually going to do an estimated systolic pressure first? Or how long are we going to have the person wait seated before we check it after they walk into the clinic? There has to be rules for sure. Um, because if we alter the way we're taking our measurements, then that in and of itself can add error and bias into the data I'm using for later hypothesis testing. So hopefully this has been helpful. Um, this has given you a brief overview of the three main types of data collection and quality quantitative studies, which are self-report, observation, and biophysiologic measures. Okay, thanks for listening.